Have you had a chance to look at this section, at least part of it? If you ask university math departments, it seems to me the thing they say that is one of the most important things to understand is the concept of what a function is. I think we learn in, in, in high school math, you learn function notation, and we're so quick to get into all of that stuff that we forget to really think about what a, fu what a function is. A f I mean, a function is just a type of relationship between quantities. It helps probably to think about a function where, you, where the quantities have meaning, where one depends on the other. Usually when you, when you talk about a function, you're talking about, I mean, you know the notation, y equals f of x. It isn't just three variables or something like that. This part of it is, is a shorthand for just saying some function that we don't really care about what it is, right? It could be anything. I mean, it could be, it could be that the function is, well, whatever, this number squared plus three. That could be what f stands for. It could be square root of that number uh, minus seven, whatever. It could be anything, right? That, that just stands for some unknown or not unknown, but it's it's a shorthand for some kind of relationship that maybe isn't so important to be specific about right now. If you look at specific values here, here's a couple of examples of things where a, a, the concept of a function might help. Temperature at which water boils at. I didn't want to put really silly ones that you obviously know now, right? Like the number of uh, legs in the room is, is a function of the number of people in the room. I mean, obviously, right? Or the number of desks and chairs and that kind of stuff. And will generate all kinds of really high-level discussion. But I thought I'd put something more interesting in here, like, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but the temperature that water boils at changes as you go up in elevation. When you say that, what does water boil at? 100. It boils at 100 at sea level, right? If your elevation is zero, it boils at 100. It goes up, sorry, it goes, as the elevation goes up, it goes down approximately three degrees Celsius per thousand meters per kilometer. So if you go up a kilometer, like a city like Calgary is about a kilometer above sea level. So a thousand meters, it's about 97 it'll boil at. If you go up higher than that, like uh, in Denver, Colorado, the mile high city, um, they, uh, they uh, I don't know what it boils at there. It uh, is a lot lower than that, obviously. If you went to the top of Mount Everest, I think it's 8,000 or 9,000 meters or something like that. I think it's about 70 degrees that it should boil at. I don't know if anybody's actually gone up their boiled water to check it, but in theory, that's what it should be, right? It's dependent on, well, they, they're kind of a limited time up there, right? And that's probably the last thing they want to do. Um, but that's a function, right? You could say that if you're using T for temperature, at, at like the boiling point, you could say it's some function of elevation, right? We could work out what the equation is using some of the points. I think I just told you what it was. It's like three, three degrees per thousand meters. So if you're, if you're doing it in terms of elevation in meters, you got to do something crazy like this, negative 0 0.003 times whatever your elevation is plus, what would the y-intercept of that be? The y-intercept is the initial value of something. In other words, the value at zero. What would it be? 100, right? Yeah, because at, at zero, it's 100. So it's going to be 100 here. You might write it uh, you know, a different way, 100 minus that. But it's going to go down like that. That's This is the specific function, but you can use this notation to stand for whatever that function happens to be. In this case, it's multiply it by that and add 100 to the value but it can stand for anything. There's a couple other functions written up there that are maybe sort of obvious as well. The amount by which your savings grows depends on the interest rate. The concept of a function, you need to think about which is the dependent and which is the independent variable. Sometimes it's not so obvious. I think for this temperature one, which of these things depends on the other one? Which one sort of comes first? Or which one, which one is just arbitrarily set and then the other one? It maybe depends on your point of view, but... The way we've set it up here, this is the independent one. First, there's some certain elevation, and then the boiling point is dependent on that elevation. Or in the case of savings here and the interest rate, the amount that you have as your savings, whatever variable you're going to use for that, savings is some function of the rate. The rate is whatever it is, and then your savings depends on that rate. Okay, so independent and dependent variable, that concept. Here's all you know. All the talk about what what functions are. 
uh, and independent variable and stuff there. One thing that is maybe new to you is is this kind of notation that you're going to find in the textbook that we use. It might be more in the American textbooks, uh, more common. But uh, but either one, I don't care which notation you use, but it's probably helpful to know both of them. This this can be called I don't know what we call it here interval notation. Um, I guess it's just because people are lazy and they like to uh, invent notations that are shorter and shorter. So if you want to say something like x is greater than or equal to 2, that's obviously one way to say it. This, this interval notation says think of it on a number line and then put the boundaries at each end. x is greater than 2 means you have a 2 there and then you have all the numbers going up this way. Is there an upper boundary on that? No. So what you do is you say it starts at 2 and it ends at infinity. If it includes 2, you call it a closed interval. If it's a closed interval, you put a square bracket. If, it's an, if, if there isn't a definite point, you can say is the end point. It's an open interval. Infinity is not really an end point. So this is an open interval. On that side, you put a round bracket. I probably should have started something with two finite numbers. Like if you want to say from uh, from negative 3 up to 2. And let's say one of them's open and one of them's closed here. If you have all the numbers in between there. Oh, that's great. If you want to say all the numbers in between there, you say negative 3 up to 2. It includes the 2, so you put a square bracket. It does not include the negative 3. It's an open interval, so it's a round bracket. It's open because there isn't a number. You can't tell me what the, the lowest number is here that's included. So that's interval notation. You're also, of course, welcome to write it in the other notation, x or whatever the variable happens to be like that. But you should understand both of them. Okay? I know it's troubling because sometimes it looks like a point, but you'll understand if someone's talking about intervals. Okay, it's a way of it's a way of writing those numbers like that. When you're uh, identifying domain and range here, it wouldn't hurt you to try and use both notations just to make sure you're comfortable with it. I'm assuming you can draw that graph without a calculator, but maybe some of the other ones you uh, you might need some help with. Remember that the calculator is uh, not necessarily the highest uh, level of technology, especially if you're using one of the ones I borrowed. Um, I'm not going to bother you with the first one, but some of the other ones here, if you put in, you know, slightly changing the function makes it look a little bit different, right? Maybe we'll do this square root of 4 minus x squared. If you put in square root of 4 minus x squared, square root 4 minus x squared, that should actually be... If you just look at it, I don't know what you're choosing for the window. If you just look at it on the standard window, it looks like that. This is actually not proportionally correct, right? Because one unit this way is different than one unit that way. It actually is a semicircle. If you want to look at it as a semicircle, you could either do, for this one, you'll be able to see it if you do zoom decimal. Zoom decimal just makes every pixel equal. It makes each pixel 0.1 on the screen. So it gets up to about 4.7 each way and 3.1 up and down. It, that, that represents a semicircle. That's a rational function because of the square root. If you wanted to draw the other half of the semicircle using another function, by the way, how would you do it on here? Yeah, just negative that. If you want, you could put negative, and there's no copy and paste on here. You could put the whole thing again. Or there is a way to do this if you want to know this now just off the... Just because if you push variables and you go over to y variables function, you can do that as the, the short way to do it. This has nothing to do with what is on the page, by the way. It's just a uh, random fact. Then it draws the other half of that circle if you want. But anyways, if you're writing down the domain and the range, in this case it does include the, the points there. Right? This is going to be from negative 4. I mean negative 2 up to there. Or you could say negative 2, 2, like that. Okay? I will leave you to, to doing and finishing that. And then likely next time, um, that's where we're going to start.
looking at even and odd functions. 